Welcome to the American Natural History Museum. What a great place. Tonight, we're going to get a rare peek into the world of the Arctic through the eyes of three of the world's most elusive and mysterious creatures. Pictures are fantastic you're going to see tonight, by the way. They live in the most inhospitable climate on Earth. The creatures are three unique Arctic whales, the beluga, the bowhead, and the narwhal. How they got their names, I'm going to ask them that as well. Tonight, we brought together a remarkable and elite group of researchers who know more about these animals and their habitats than just about anybody else on the planet. As the Arctic is drastically and rapidly changing, these whales really are our insights into how rising temperatures are affecting not just their world, but of course, our world as well. They are literally our canaries in a coal mine, the whales in the Arctic. Their health is the warning signal to our health, to our children's health, to our grandchildren's health, and our environment as well. And this is most important tonight, which is why this symposium, while we'll learn a lot about the whales themselves, it's really about learning about ourselves and our world and our environment, is when we see these whales behaving differently, that's when we know that they're canaries in a coal mine. We see the dangers headed far beyond the waters of the Arctic. Over the course of tonight's program, we're going to learn how these whales are telling us things we wouldn't be able to know without them. That is the key sentence to this program. The technology, with technology and thanks to it, and thanks to the whales themselves, we're learning more about them than we ever imagined we could as we literally race against the changing environment and learn to adjust. We're going to start with the voices themselves before you meet these remarkable women, three of them first to start with. Uh, they're going to talk about some of their amazing experiences in the Arctic. I think it takes a lifetime or more to read the ice. Where is it grounded? Where will it open and when? Is that crack new? There's so many things to pay attention to. And are there any fresh polar bear tracks nearby? I love seeing bears out on the ice, from a distance. My name is Kate Stafford, and I'm a researcher who studies the sounds of the Arctic, the sounds under the ice, the sounds of whales, the sounds of seals, and increasingly, anthropogenic sounds. Sounds made by man. The ice in the Arctic is everyone's best friend. The whales need it for protection. And us humans need it as our transportation system. It's really our highway that allows us to get out onto the ocean to where the animals are. I'm Sarah Robertson and I've been making documentary films in the Arctic for the last 20 years. Diving under the ice is really one of the most exhilarating things I've done in the Arctic. My name is Kristen Lydra and I'm a biologist. Studying narwhals definitely comes with its challenges. These whales are also very shy and skittish, so they prefer to be in dense ice and they spend most of their time at pretty deep depths, making them difficult to observe. A lot of my work has been conducted on narwhals in the pack ice. We will fly in a helicopter out over the ice and find the leads and cracks where narwhals spend the winter and observe them, tag them, and make acoustic recordings. Studying these animals really gives us not only a feel for unraveling scientific mysteries, but also how they are responding to the physical changes that come with a general warming in the Arctic. Pretty cool. The spectacular footage you saw just now comes from one of the few people who have literally come eye to eye underwater with the Arctic whales. Please welcome wildlife and science documentary producer, Sarah Robertson. Hi, Sarah. Glad to see you. Our next uh, panel member and participant knows more about narwhals, including what the name came from, than almost anyone else on the planet. She joins us from the University of Washington's Polar Science Center. Please welcome Kristen Lydra. Kristen? 
Joining us also from the University of Washington, a woman who is a professional eavesdropper. By listening to whales, our next participant is uncovering secrets and the hidden lies of bowheads and narwhals and belugas, Kate Stafford. I have my entire research book here. I, I don't think I'm going to need it because I think these three people are more expert than any of the research I could have, but I think I've known, I've tried to read up a little bit. This is a land of extremes, as we know. Temperatures ranging from 50 degrees above to 50 degrees below. It goes from no light at all to 24 hours of daylight. In winter, ice can cover 99% of the ocean. Eight countries lay claim to parts of the Arctic, but we know who the taxpayers are, they're the animals that you all study. This, although they don't pay any taxes, but the ice-covered land is home to the narwhal, the beluga, and the bowhead whales, and we're going to start our discussion. Krista, with you, I want to take a look at the, at the narwhal. Um, they call it the unicorn of the sea. It's almost hard to believe that such a creature exists. Why? What is it? Tell us why, is this, why it looks like it does. Sure. Well, I mean, the narwhal is one of the two toothed whales that live in the Arctic. And it's a little bit different. There's the, the beluga is the other tooth whale, but the narwhal has basically one big tooth, and it's found in the males, and it's this long tusk that grows out of the top upper uh, lip. And otherwise, it has no teeth in its mouth. So, so tooth whale is, is uh, kind of an exaggeration. Um, it's a, a very interesting, elusive Arctic whale where um, there are many mysteries, and, and it's very extreme in a number of ways. Why does it have that? Where does that come from? Well, they, so there are, two, there are two teeth in the, in the upper uh, jaw of the narwhal, and they're embedded. And in the male, when the male, um, as the male grows, the left one erupts and turns into the spiral tusk. And females, for the most part, when you open up their skull, you just see these teeth that never erupted. And it's, you know, the tusk is, um, Darwin wrote a lot about the tusk. The tusk is a, a male trait, which is essentially used for um, establishing dominance and competing for females and sort of deciding who's, you know, who's going to get the the female on the block. So now we all know that we know where the male narwhal is, right? And yeah. we know where the female narwhals are. And, and, but that's not how they identify themselves, right? Uh, I, th I, you think you know, I can't say. But uh, <laughs> occasionally they'll have two tusks, too. So that's a very rare, rare male with two tusks. A well-tusked yeah. narwhal is always uh, <laughs> big in the wild. Um, so where do you go to study the narwhal? Where does this take you? Well, so narwhals are, for the most part, they're found in the Canadian Arctic, and they're found on both coasts of Greenland, and some narwhals are actually found up towards Svalbard, which is on the east coast of Greenland. Um, much of the work I've done has been either in the Canadian Arctic or in West Greenland, um, usually about 70 degrees north latitude and, and north of that. Um, I go and I live in, in field camps, or I live on small boats. Um, occasionally, I live in, in small huts and, and use a helicopter to get out to the narwhals. And, you know, where I live really depends on what kind of study we're doing. And, and, and is that why, because it's so far away, that we lo know so little about the novel? I mean, well, you know a lot, but, but and the world doesn't know much. Yeah, about. I mean, it, part of it is that they're far away. I mean, it, part, part of the reason we know so little about the narwhal is they're, they're, they're very difficult whale to study. So they, um, they're extremely shy and skittish. I mean, one, one noise, one move, if they even notice you're there, they're gone. They, they do not really like to be around people. Um, they're very deep diving whales, so they spend a lot of their time underwater. So they're, they're not at the surface very often to, you know, to be observed. They live very far offshore, many hundreds of miles, and they live for most of the year in very dense ice. So there are a number of factors, all of those factors kind of go into to making them relatively difficult to study and, and, and track through, you know, through time. So have you gone out to look for narwhals and not been able to see them because oh, they're yeah. so shy? I spent many weeks waiting for narwhals and never seen one, yeah. Sounds like the title of a book, Waiting yeah, for Narwhal. Yeah, it could be. Okay, well that's give us a little first, first Brit introduction to the narwhal. We want to move to the, uh, to the beluga and we ask Sarah. Um, I guess the question that a lot of people have first is, why are they so white? What's up with that? Well, why are they white? I, you see a lot of animals in the Arctic, white animals, the polar bear, the ptarmigan, which is a, a bird. Uh, so the uh, most obvious idea would be to say that it's camouflage because these animals live deep in the ice and depend on ice for protection uh, from predators. And so a white animal would blend in nicely in the ice. Um, also, 
and completely sort of an opposite idea to this is, is kind of curious. I am a diver, so I go underwater with these animals. And when I see these animals underwater, they literally just glow. You can see them miles back, you can see them coming, and they just glow like angels in the, in the dark abyss. Doesn't so sound they, like much of a camouflage. No, though, does it? and so that's what I'm thinking. You think, oh, that's surprising. But maybe, yeah. even though they're, they're very social animals and they have fantastic echolocation, they can find each other very easily, but I'm wondering, maybe they like to be able to see each other underwater and it helps them uh, keep together. These are speculations. This, uh, you know, I don't know the exact reason why would, they would be white. They start off gray when they're first born, um, and then I think by the age of one or two, the gray sloughs off, and they slowly turn white. They don't just uh, come out white. And it takes, I think, maybe a, a big bull would take eight years to become beautiful white like this thing like I, this animal on the screen. And I, I think, unlike the Norwal, all due respect, I, I <laughs> think that my, my children, when they were younger, would have said they're adorable. Yeah. Right? They, yeah, they, they look yeah, like look they're at smiling. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're white, we love white animals, and they have this wonderful, big, smiley face. It looks like they're smiling, and that's why we love these animals so much. Okay, yeah. Kate, Kate, you have an equally tough commute. Mm -hmm. Where do you study the Arctic whales? My work primarily is up in Barrow, Alaska, so up in the Alaskan Arctic which is at the confluence of the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. And the population of bowhead whales that I've spent most time with is actually the healthiest currently. Um, we think they've rebounded from whaling and, and maybe doing very well, unlike, there, there's four populations of bowheads around the Arctic and the Bering Chukchi Beaufort or the, the Western Arctic population is, is doing quite well. How, how passionate you guys think you are. You can't just do this if you're not passionate. All the people that want to study whales, you have to be incredibly passionate to do this, right? I think passion just sort of comes naturally with it. As you said, there's many people who are very passionate about whales, um, but I think maybe persistence is, is equally important. Mm -hmm. And you have to be willing to do things like fly around for days at a time looking for narwhals, or I just spent a month up in the Arctic and the ice never opened. So the bowheads never came, well, right. they were migrating offshore, but they never came close enough for us to do any of the work we wanted to do. And you have to be fairly rugged. You all look fairly rugged and in good shape. <laughs> and I mean, that, I mean yeah. that in the best sense of the word, of yeah. course. You um, either love it or hate it. Yeah. Exactly. People go, they either just yeah. love it and they're, they're stuck, yeah. and they want to go back, or people just, oh, I hate this, and they'll never out. go back. <laughs> yeah. so. what's, the, what's the biggest mystique about the beluga? About the beluga? Well, belugas are called sometimes canaries of the sea because they're so vocal and they can produce lots of different sounds and they can actually move their head back and forth. And they have this thing at the front of their head. Uh, you maybe saw it in the photo of the beluga that you showed called the melon. And if you yeah. see a beluga in an aquarium, which many people probably have, and it's making sounds, you can actually see its melon move as it's producing whistles. Wow. And the bowhead, let's talk a little bit about bowhead. It, it, has, a, a, a nick, it has a nickname. Did someone say that they knew what the nickname was? One of you earlier? Well, we were discussing that. <laughs> Whether it has a nickname or not, yeah. my research is not accurate. I mean, it's been, it has been known as the right whale because bowheads were, um, were, were hunted for commercial whaling for, for many years and they were known as the right whale to kill because they, um, they produced a huge amount of oil. I mean, they're an enormous whale and, and you could kind of get a lot out of one and they floated after you harpooned them. So it was kind of the right whale. The right whale and the yeah. head. And this, yeah, the big boat head, mm -hmm. yeah, where they get their name. Bow head. Bow head. So yeah. it's not some uh, mysterious uh, uh, label. It's, it makes sense, right? That yeah. It's called oh, no. If, if you look at this animal that's breaching, you can yep. see the eye. That's the white circle. Mm -hmm. Everything forward of the eye is head. That's all skull. Mm -hmm. So that's fully a third of, of its body. Of its body. The head length. being in the mi uh, just about two, whatever, in the middle there, the little, I mean, the eye. The right eye is that, that, that round thing spot. in the middle. Yeah. And then its chin is up at the top. And so they have this giant bowed skull that helps support their very long baleen that can be 12 feet long. And in fact, bowhead whales were killed both for their oil but also for their baleen, mm -hmm. which was used in really important things like ladies' corsets <laughs> and riding whips and umbrellas. <laughs> that was called whalebone. It wasn't bone, actually, right, it was right. the baleen. Um, what don't we know about these guys? Well, the reason we don't know very much about many Arctic species is, as you pointed out earlier, the Arctic is a really difficult place to work. It's dark, it's cold, it's hard to get to. Um, 
and these animals spend most of their time, they are ice-adapted whales, they are Arctic whales, so they can be very difficult to find. Um, for myself, one of the things that, that we don't know very well about the bowhead uh, is bowhead, bowhead whales produce songs, very similar to, but much more interesting, than humpback whale songs, mm -hmm. which many people <laughs> might be familiar with. And it's not really clear why they sing and who sings, and instead of everybody singing the same song, they sing many, many different songs within a year and between years. So personally, for me, that's one of the big mysteries of the bowhead. And you know, the second mystery is how will they adapt to a changing Arctic? Why, should we, why we should care about what's happening to them? I mean, I would say that, I mean, of course, I mean, the majestic beauty is one thing, but we should care because, I mean, these are important species that are, you know, kind of key to this, this ecosystem that um, is changing rapidly and they can, they're indicators for us of the change. I mean, if we can understand sort of how uh, these species are you know, changing their biology or ecology, it gives us some insight into what the influence that the system is having on them. I think also um, another reason it's important is, is that the Arctic uh, isn't just a desolate place, but it, it has human populations, and all three of these whales are subsistence resources for humans around the Arctic. And so, you know, in the course of us doing our work on them, it, you know, learning about these animals, learning about how their populations are doing isn't just relevant for science or, or kind of academic questions, but also to um, the people that rely on them as a resource and, and you know, the kind of important cultural, um, you know, the rituals and things that go through with, with using them. Are you able to learn from, from the native population about how much do they, do they know intuitively or historically and traditionally? How much do they know? Oh, they know a lot, yeah. Yeah, I travel yeah. with the Inuit a lot. Um, I'm doing mostly photography and filmmaking and I would hire Inuit to take me out onto the ice flow and these people are subsistence hunters, traditionally. They know where to find the animals, uh, they know an awful lot of animal behavior, and well, first of all, what's happening to the Inuit with the ice changing, they can't even get to the animals anymore, mm -hmm. and they're unable to read the ice in predictable ways, and so just traveling on the ice is becoming a very perilous situation. Um, they are seeing um, animal behavior changes as well, and uh, you know, this is really important from my point of view, from a, a filmmaker's point of view, a documentary point of view, is to show what's happening to an ecosystem. All the things that live in the Arctic, including the Inuit, are ice dependent. And when this ice ecosystem disappears and we see the reaction to the wildlife and to the people with the whole eco ecosystem changing and disappearing, we can really sort of use those stories and say, well, what's going to happen to us and our ecosystems where we live. And we can use these stories as metaphors for ourselves. Um, and, and, and I've been really successful in creating some very powerful images that make people think that, well, well when, what are we going to do when this is happening where we live? And you've seen it, you've documented underwater with your photography yes. and, your, and your filmmaking. And in, in, in the whole range of, of activities that go on from what they eat and what they can't eat anymore and how that changes. It's been fascinating, right? What, what their, how their diet is changing based on what's happening. How is that changing? How has it changed? How have you seen it change? Well, when you're diving underwater, you don't get to see changes like that. Kirsten can talk about what they're eating. She opens the animals up. <laughs> but, uh, are you um, asking about yeah. the Inuit or, or about no. the whales themselves? Um, about, <laughs> I, I'm talking about the underwater, what we learn about what the Arctic whales eat and don't oh, okay. eat. Because yeah. one of the things I read in your research was that, that you have studied the, the underwater ecosystem and how the whales have changed what their diet are. Is that, or maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe I yeah, I mean, we, so, you know, there are different ways to study diets of these animals. It, you know, it's not easy to observe what they're doing. I mean, narwhals feed at depths of over 4,000 feet below the sea surface. So they're making dives that are, you know, over a mile deep down to the, the, like the abyss, which is completely dark and, and no place that we can go. And so, you know, we have to do, we have to use a lot of inference to figure out what they're feeding which, on, which means kind of take small pieces of information and, and put it together and, and, you know, put the story kind of in order. And so um, one way we do it is we actually look in their stomachs. So you spoke about working with the local people yeah. and, you know, working with the local people has been a huge thing for my research because they, they're, they're eager, they want to help, 
they, they harvest these animals. You can collect all kinds of samples that are really useful for looking at health of the animals, condition of the animals, what they eat. So we can look inside their stomachs. I've been through many hundreds of narwhal stomachs, which I can't recommend doing, but, but you can learn a lot. Lovely. No one's at dinner yet. What they eat. Um, we can look at, in their tissues, we can look yeah. at different types of fats and determine what they're eating. We can look at isotopes. There's a number of different ways, strictly from having your hands on an animal, that you can learn. And, and when you do deal with the native population and you tell them what you're there for, they get it right away? They distrust you? They embrace you? What's no, they, they all usually already know the answers, but they just help the scientists collect the data. <laughs> <laughs> These are not willing participants, the whales. So, so you know, but you, you're relying on them. You need them to study them. What happens? I mean, this has got to be a painstakingly slow process sometimes. Yeah, I mean, this sci science in the Arctic is a slow process. I would say that, you know, to learn one new thing, it takes sometimes many, many years and failed field seasons and lots of bad weather and no whales before you, you get one new piece of information. So it's, it takes patience. Kristen, you use satellite telemetry? How, explain what that does. Yeah, so, um, you know, one way to monitor the, the behavior of these animals is actually to track them remotely. So we can go out, we can use binoculars, and we can try to watch them or stand on a cliff, but, you know, they might swim by and you'll never see them again, or they may never swim by. So another way to do that is to um, catch animals and put transmitters on them. And the, those transmitters, the way they work is they send transmissions when the animals come up to the surface to take a breath. And those transmissions are picked up by polar orbiting satellites. And so those satellites can basically triangulate the location of the animal in space, and then they can receive a whole bunch of information like how deep the animal dove, how long it stayed underwater, what depths it, it uses to feed. And, and so those data are relayed back to us. So you're injecting some sort of yeah, tracking so there's a small, yeah, a small tracking device that's just put into the, into the very thick blubber layer of the whale, and then it stays there for up to a year, and we can track them daily and learn about their, their habits. And what so that's, that's one way we do it. And we're seeing what there? That's what that is, right? Uh, this, so this is one of the transmitters that we use on a narwhal, and um, you can see it's, it's, it's kind of like a simple small computer. It's two AA batteries and a small microprocessor, and it's encased in epoxy so it can withstand pressure. And then the small stalk you see on the top actually samples temperature, so the whales themselves actually sample the ocean for us. And then the big black thing you see is the antenna, and that sends the transmissions up to the satellite. And so you learn a ton, I assume, from, yeah. from migration to yeah. uh, group behavior? What do yeah, you learn? Yeah, you, you learn uh, movements and migrations and where they spend the summer and the winter. You learn you know, information on behavior, diving behavior and surfacing behavior. You learn you know, the temperatures in the areas that they like to feed. Um, from all that information, you can infer, um, you know, are they feeding in certain areas or are they not? And, um, you know, are they moving quickly through areas or are they st kind of lingering and sticking around because that area might be important? So you can infer all kinds of, of behavior just from those instruments. They're, they're extraordinarily valuable in the Arctic. And you can use, this, you use the same technology for the other whales? Not just, not just yours, right? Yeah, yeah, I, it's been used on all that? three whales yeah. across the Arctic. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you track the same thing? You do the same thing? No, no, I use acoustics to track whales. Yeah. And we're going to talk about acoustics a little later, right? By the way, because that's a and big they, part of it. Are Go they ahead. staying on how long now? That, can it stay on the whole year? Yeah, we've, on yeah. narwhals, we've had them on for over a year. So yeah. we've been able to track their whole annual migration. With yeah. double, two AA batteries? Yeah. <laughs> in the Arctic? We, our flashlights yeah. go yeah. out. Yeah. In the power outage, how does that work? In the work? Arctic, but yeah, it, we, I don't know. <laughs> Just good, good technology. It but goes but a long way. If, if they're so shy, if they don't want to get near you, how do you get that close that you did to, to, to inject it? Well, I, for the narwhals, we actually capture them in nets, so we have to kind of trick them. We set big nets in areas where narwhals swim by, and then we wait for weeks and weeks and weeks and watch the nets 24 hours a day constantly, and then if we get lucky, one narwhal will swim into the net, and then we go out and, and you know, disentangle the whale and bring it to the surface and put a tag on it and let it go. So it's a very, you, you wait a month to put one instrument and, on. And you know, it's not like a little kid with the fishing line and all of a sudden starts tugging. How do you know it's in the net? You just have to watch the net? The net, so the nets are lined with buoys yeah. and that float at the surface and we have basically a constant 24 hour rotating watch and you, you literally stand there and stare at the buoys and you know, look and see if whales are coming from either direction. And, and when, when a whale goes in the net, it's, it's kind of a, there's a big, force that pulls the buoys under. And when the buoys go under, then you get in an inflatable boat and, and go out and bring the whale to the surface. So cool. Now, you all have the same 
uh, stories to tell about waiting forever, waiting for Narwhal or waiting for Beluga or waiting? Oh, yeah. How long have you waited? A well, month. <laughs> in 30-day 30, 30 field trip, you'd be lucky to get five good days. Yeah. So yeah. you could be waiting in a tent in the pouring rain, you know, for 25 days. And so what, what, have, you, what have you learned from this 25 days of, of waiting and, and nothing happening? Patience. Solitary. How many people go? Uh, what, what, what are these people like? What if you don't like somebody? What happens? You're stuck up in the Arctic, right? Well, I've often said that they should really make the real Survivor show <laughs> on some of our trips up in the Arctic because that is what really surviving is. These, these other people, they don't know. <laughs> Survival, <laughs> narwhal, Arctic. Tell me about the bowhead. Um, Kate, a little bit. It's big mouth. We talked about that yep. already. Big head. But the mouth is also big, right? Yeah, the mouth is enormous. Um, as I said, the baleen, which um, they don't have teeth bowheads, unlike narwhals and belugas. They have these plates of baleen, which are made out of this keratinous, and you can see some of the plates here. And those long fringe at the end are used to catch tiny, tiny, tiny little plankton. Um, bowheads prefer copepods, which are about the size of a grain of rice, but are surprisingly fatty. Uh, they'll also eat euphausids, which are, are krill, which are a little bit bigger. Um, and these plates of baleen are so big so that they can process large volumes of food at one time. They don't necessarily need their food to be very condensed. They can just mow through the water. And sometimes you'll see them lying on their side and the baleen will be flopping around in the air. And I've often wondered how they could shove it all back in their mouth. You'd think they'd be wanting to eat chips, not uh, little <laughs> flecks of... A rice, but they eat thousands of them, right? So that's millions. What, millions of millions. them. That's what I meant, millions of them. And if uh, you'll, you'll look at a stomach and it'll be packed full with, of copepods. And how long do they live? Bowheads, so the Inupiats say that and bowheads live... how do you tell live, how old a boy it is? Well, the Inupiats say bowheads live two human lifetimes. And we think they live over 200 years. And um, that's been confirmed by scientists in two ways. One is with these whales that are harvested in a, in a traditional hunt. You'll sometimes find either stone points or harpoon heads that date back to the 1800s. And you can date those very precisely. But also, you can look at the chemical composition of the eye and look at the percentage of uh, it's the rasmization of the eye and detect how old the whale is that way. And some of the oldest whales have been documented as being anywhere from 160 to over 200 years old. Can you just see this better A or B? <laughs> to the um, we have a, uh, some great pictures of the narwhal actually tusking and get you guys to comment about it as we're seeing this. What, what's going on there? Well, those, so those narwhals are surfacing in a, in a lead. You can see it, there's, they're pretty much there's enclosed by ice. And, you know, when you have a 10-foot-long tooth sticking out of your, your head, you kind of have to come up in a maybe not very elegant way. No. But uh, tusking behavior can be, you know, it can be kind of fast like that, but it can often be very slow. Males will, will um, come at the surface and, and cross their tusks and interact slowly, and often there's a female nearby when we've observed that, but yeah. Now, the tusking behavior can be, from a photographic point of view, one of the most evocative mm -hmm. images that you'd ever see in the North because you have these, you know, two males. I almost always see the males, you know, doing it. I mean, there's the ones with the tusks. So you have, they have these long, beautiful ivory tusks, and they're crossing them. Mm. And they call this jousting. And you'd see that they would bring the tusk down the other, the other tusk, and so they're touching them. Um, and it's, even though they call it jousting, the animals aren't fighting. They do it very gently. And you even get the sense that they don't want to break the, the tusk. tusk. Yeah. They don't want to hurt each other. I think that this is really um, important for them not to break the tusk. When I started going to the Arctic about 20 years ago, 23 years ago now, I would go out onto the ice with the Inuit hunters onto the flow edge, and that's where you could see the animals. And um, I would be doing this in the spring, and we would see this behavior of this jousting behavior. And you said, oh, as a photographer, this is the, the, the sort of the, the holy grail shot to get. And I say, oh my God, they're jousting, they're jousting. And the Inuit would say, no, we got to get off the ice. You got to get off the ice now. So and it's to a the warning. Inuit, to the Inuit, this behavior was a sign to them that they'd always known to get off the ice because the ice is going to start to break up and we couldn't go. be on the ice any longer. It was going to be too dangerous for humans to be on the ice. And so we always had to race off the ice and sure enough, 
within 12 hours, the ice where we were at was broken up. So obviously the Norwal knew something, we didn't. We're gonna talk about <laughs> what the ice means in our next segment. I wanna get some film you shot of Norwals underwater. Well, those are aerial pictures of Nor. There's some underwater, yeah. You took these? Yeah. How far away were you from them? Well, you, to get any shot underwater, you need to be right up. You're right there, you're very close. So you're right there. And uh, yeah, and I've had narwhal face right at me and echolocate right at my body and I could feel their echolocation just vibrating right off my body. And they're checking me out. When they're doing that, they check out what you are and what you look like and your shape and your, you know, maybe even what's inside. They have a sort of a 3D vision of objects. And that was very cool. Wow, yeah. and what did that feel like? What did that feel like when you Well, were... I was afraid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. They didn't start tusking or anything. Yeah, like that, I didn't know if it was going to skewer me or not. <laughs> you used the word echolocation. Tell our audience what that means. Well, you're the echolocation expert. Yeah. And I'm going to talk to you about, you're the about the sound, expert, too. Because yeah. we're going to, okay, yeah. then before we get that, let's listen to some sounds yeah. that Kate actually had of uh, echolocation, I guess. Let's hear it. This is a bowhead song. This is a singing bowhead whale, but it's not echolocation. I mean, it's beautiful, but if I were there, I'd get the hell out of there, right? I, I, I think I would. That's, it can be kind of a little disarming, although mm -hmm. it's gorgeous when you're sitting here in New York City. Well, that's meant to be a, it's very likely a song that's a male reproductive display, so you might not think it's beautiful. Yeah, but, <laughs> but the females in the audience like it, I guess. Um, so t explain how you got that. Uh, that was actually recorded with something called a sauna buoy. In fact, Kristen did those recordings up off of Greenland by going out in the middle of the dark on the ice and plopping an instrument in a hole. And this particular instrument transmitted the signals that it recorded underwater via radio to an Arctic research station on Disco Bay in Greenland. Thanks. And I called Kate, I called you from Greenland because when I heard this I thought something must be terribly wrong <laughs> because it's just such a crazy sound and, and uh, brought it back to her and then she, she analyzed the data and made a paper out of it. That is so cool. Yeah. Um, thank you all very much. You're going to come back and talk a little bit about more of the environmental questions here. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but we want to bring our next guests out. But um, Kate, Kristen, and Sarah, thank you very much. This is really interesting. You're all very cool. And I think... <laughs> so anybody who wants their daughters to grow up to be scientists, there's a, exhibits A, B, and C as to why, why that should happen. We're going to take a step back. Uh, several decades to 1973, Richard Nixon was still president, and an ex expedition to the Arctic to document for the very first time, we, we sort of, this is de rigueur now to document these animals, but the very first time the bowhead uh, was actually documented was in this piece of clip, piece of film clip taken by our next guest. Our search for the leviathan of the cold Arctic seas, the bowhead whale, began over the sea ice along the extreme northern shores of Alaska. The latest in modern technology was to be employed in an attempt to find out something about this gigantic creature that was brought so close to the edge of extinction. We followed a promising looking lead to the south. And then at last, we saw our first evidence of the presence of whales. We were sure the breathing holes were made by whales, possibly beluga. This was a good sign because bowhead often travel in the company of beluga. Hey, you guys, I saw a bowhead. Look, it's just in to the left there. Which hole? I saw it. I'm sure I saw a bowhead. There, there, look. Oh, just to the side oh, right there. Jim, swing it to the left. There! See, there he is! I told you! See? I there told you he was right there! A bowhead and a halo of belugas! Look at him! Can thing. you move in on that? Just bring her down a little lower now. The Eskimos were right! Look at that blow! They are huge! He's gone.
is that cool or what? 1973, that was taken. Please welcome a, a whale pioneer, a true explorer, a poet, just a magnificent guy, and uh, the guy who started it all, the first man to document this, Scott McVeigh. Scott? <laughs> How are you? Come on. You're sitting this morning. No, no, no. <laughs> Sit right here. Well, I couldn't help but, but notice that you were a little more than excited when you uh, went. Well, look at that. It was like the Yankees won the World Series for the first time or something. Uh, t when you see that, uh, does it take you back to that moment in 1973? Last Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's what it seems like, right? It's 40 years ago. It was yep. my second Arctic expedition. And what you're seeing is just the very front end of the film, which anyone here can actually watch on your computer, search in, in search of the bowhead whale, and you can watch it. But the finale... Is, is quite extraordinary. We literally, we have only three hours of fuel in our helicopter. And uh, it takes one hour to get in position. And we had two divers that are in the water with 40 sleek belugas. And the belugas were very shy, very reticent, very skittish. And uh, when the men went to one end of the crack, the belugas had come to the other end. And, and then, all of a sudden, with literally only minutes left in terms of our fuel supply, a great bowhead whale surfaces right there, and it blows nine times. And, and the incomparable Bill Mason is the, is the cameraman, uh, and he captures the last three blows, and we got the diver in the water coming nose to nose with the whale. And uh, it's a breathtaking moment, and it's what we'd worked for the whole expedition for that moment to happen in the water. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, the, and then after the bowhead leaves, and, and the Inuits had told us before that when, they, when, they, when a bowhead whale surfaces, there's a symbiotic relationship with the beluga. And uh, after the bowhead had left, the beluga then became quite obstreperous. One guy slaps down his, his flukes. Two others go like this. The big guy in the group went all the way up. You could see his navel and Whoa, like that. And then, but, so the relationship with the human participants changed Dramatic. dramatically. Yeah, so what did that tell you? What were they doing? What did you think it was happening? Well, it's, it's like they somehow felt very confirmed by their big brother. These are, uh, as, as, as was just discussed, uh, the blue whale may be the, of the 85 species of, of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, may be the most sonically precocious. And there's various populations of beluga located around the Arctic and also descending south. And they're, uh, the kinds of sounds they make vary tremendously from group to group. You, you, talked, you talked there when you, when you I, I think I could hear it properly, the, the, Bowheads are surrounded by belugas. Well, they tend there was to be. the one bowhead. The one was, yeah. And, and, and a, and a but where you of... see belugas, there may be bowheads, right? Well, somewhere. You'll, you'll find belugas in, in a given area. And one of the discoveries we made on our first expedition, there's the working assumption that uh, a dolphin, say Terceops truncatus, never sleeps. And the thought is, well, maybe half the brain's asleep, but the other half stays, uh, stays very awake because of the necessity to breathe and it's a semi-voluntary process. Well, we demonstrated the fact in the first expedition that, and this is, and, and it was in mid-April at that time when the leads began to open up, then they closed at night because there'd be a half right. inch of ice would form over the leads. Well, we find in the morning when we went out in a chopper that there was an ice pattern that had formed over a pod of belugas so that each, each one had kind of a bottle outline and there was a small hole where the blowhead went. So they'd been actually sleeping for hours because, uh, because uh, the ice was so firm. And if we come down with a helicopter below 200 feet, they'd break up and swim away. But it, it, it showed, and, and also the, the pattern that was formed, they all f uh, faced in on the largest of, of, of the belugas. And uh, one time we saw a double roseate pattern 
where there are two pods quite close together, but in these similar ice formations. And you can see it from above. Yes. You're talking about. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. see it when you're down on the ground, right? It's like, well, no. And, and, and also, they would, they, again, they're quite skittish. They, they'd, they'd slip away. Why is it 1973? We'd already been to the moon four years before. Why, why is this the first time someone documents this for bowheads? Well, to me, backing up a little bit, I had been fortunate to discover and document the six octave song of the humpback whale and publish this as a cover article with, with, with Roger Payne. And uh, there have now been nearly 400 other papers on the songs of the humpback whale, but this is the baseline document. And we even asserted that, and it's, it's, I'm surprised the editor didn't scrub it out, but we said this is a surprisingly beautiful sound. Well, that's an aesthetic judgment. <laughs> but a lot of people agree with that. Yeah, they scrubbed it out, but they left it in there, and it's true. It may be the, the most interesting. Uh, Melville had described the humpback whale as the most gamesome and lighthearted of all the whales, making more gay foam and white water than any other of them. But he would be astonished to know of the song. That's just amazing. What did it, what did you, what did it feel like when you first heard those sounds? Well, it was thrilling. I, I got goosebumps, and my goosebumps got goosebumps. <laughs> and, uh, but I worked away at it, and, uh, and then... I discovered that in, in this cacophony of, of, of sounds recorded at one time uh, that all what turned out to be male whales were singing the same song. It just wasn't in synchrony. And uh, Katie Payne made a maybe more interesting discovery that over time, parts of that song drop out and parts are added so that after a period of four or five or six years, you've got a completely different song. And then you think, well, the Caruso in the group must yeah. Do, have, have the best luck with the girls, but, but that, it turns out to be not the case at all. We do not have a single example in the intervening years of a female humpback whale, either off Hawaii, Maui, or the Big Island, or in Bermuda or Puerto Rico. These are separate. There are nine or ten different populations mm -hmm. of humpback whales. And not a single instance has been documented of a female responding to the song. So it must be a male thing having to do with their comparative status among one another. And so why do they keep doing it, do you think? If the females aren't responding... The males are interested in the females. They yeah. often... The females are demurring yes. in one way or another. Okay. But the song itself, uh, as it evolves and as it changes, is terribly significant in terms of, of, of one or another. And, of course, all sorts of very famous people, not that yourself is not, not, you're not, you're very famous, but other famous people uh, took this. Carl Sagan used these songs, well, right? Well, Carl Sagan took our tapes and put them on Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 when they were released in 1977 mm -hmm. and traveled across the, it's this little package of 198 pounds that, that carried also these tapes. Carl had also visited, I used to work for John Lilly for a couple of years, one-on-one -on -one with a very yeah. precocious golfer named Elvar. That's where I learned to use the sound spectrograph. But Carl Sagan came and visited, and he was by far the sharpest visitor we'd ever had. And he was very interested in what we were doing uh, with regard to the level of cognition and uh, awareness of, of these creatures so alien from us, fellow mammals, but having perhaps a level of awareness and cognition similar to ours, but somewhat alien. And of course, uh, baby boomers in the, in the audience will know uh, David Crosby and Graham Nash did a song, right, trying to somehow mirror the sounds of whales with their own beautiful voices. It's fantastic. I listened to it uh, uh, today. Uh, most importantly, it seems to me, that the sounds of the whales, the humpback sounds, started uh, the movement to save the whales. Well, they, uh, more they than were... anything else, which is why I think a lot of people are here, because that's how they first heard about whales, well, save the whales. I, I, I thought that they did become the anthem for whale conservation and actually conservation writ large. I took the tapes to uh, Japan in August of 1970, and your analog over there uh, went on NHK for an hour into 33 million Japanese homes. And we started, they were totally amazed at the sounds. Even the people in the whaling industry, but also the top writers, the top scientists of the country got very involved, and we made tremendous progress. But I've often thought, as we learn more about the natural world, this will stay our hand. This will change our behavior. And I'm still hoping that even this splendor work of these, these women scientists will enable us to 
think of the natural world with awe and wonder and treat it with a greater respect. Well, it did make a difference, though. The whaling industry was drastically affected, right? What's the status of it today? Well, uh, right now, supposedly, they can take the sperm whale, which is comparatively abundant, and the minke whale, which was ignored for decades and decades, only a 25-foot whale has a white stripe on one flipper. But if you go to a, a, a market in Tokyo where they sell whale meat, and you take a sample of that meat, and you go back to your room, and you test it for DNA, you'll find fin whales, right whales, humpback whales, zai whales, broody whales, and you find the whole span, and also now we can even figure out what the stocks of these whales are, where they came from. So they will tend to take whatever moves, but the Japanese have lost much of their taste for the whales, and, and, and the ablest people within the country are extremely sympathetic to the thought of, of, of their continuing existence. And your helicopter trip, looking for, the, for this whale, led to all that. I mean, this is a great legacy. Uh, you know, you don't, you're, you're, you don't seem like a boastful guy, but that's a pretty big deal, right? You've got to feel pretty great about that. Well, I tell you, what I were right? hoping... I mean, I think no. so. <laughs> what well, well, we're hoping for was the next generation of scientists, which you have just spoken to and you'll be speaking to again. We'll carry that on, right? Yeah. And for anybody who goes to Japan, take your DNA whale kit and uh, take it back to your hotel room and figure out exactly where uh, all, the, all the species are that, uh, that are inside that. You have a poem uh, that you wanted to read uh, before we say goodbye. Well, um, with, with, whenever I was doing science of any kind, I, uh, you, 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 you did the proper thing for peer-reviewed journals wherever they were. But this is the third of what I call a triptych to the ice whale. And this is the experience, if you will, of the man in the water, who happened to be Joe McGinnis, the lead diver in Canada, and also thinking about you know, what the future looks like. What, what is our relationship to these creatures? These are fellow mammals. I mean, there's only 5,000 plus mammals on Earth. And <clears throat> this is um, whale as island moving toward me. Imagine the unlikely. A single will to see Leviathan close in without harassment, to record its form and motions and mood and sounds in the icy fastness of a remote, forbidding world. Imagine the unlikely. 31 miles from ice camp, two divers work with 40 sleek, wheeling white whales in a narrow water crack Little whales, at first afraid, tightly schooling, later miffed at the intrusion, making waist-high visual probes and fierce tail slaps. Yet without our presence, do you remember the easy rolls, the meanderings, lollings at the surface as we approached? Have you ever seen as pure a place? Imagine the unlikely. Just as the hour drew to a close, with time short and fuel low, at the last possible moment, with Botticelli timing, a great bowhead whale emerged with double crown and rose before us like the lost Atlantis. Miracles sometimes stand alone, but this island came and went, drawing nearer nine unbelieving times, while our drivers while our diver, too, crossed the distance and a camera rolled to hold forever the ineffable and share the wordless wonder of a gentle encounter far away on Easter Day between a crowned monster and one of us in a ballet, the final act unwritten, imagine the unlikely. Beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> you, uh... You certainly imagined the unlikely before you saw what you saw in the film. Uh, and we saw, we heard your excitement, and it was palpable. Uh, and you say you remember it as if it were last Wednesday. How many other times did you see it? How many times have you been back since 1973? Well, no, I, I first went in 71, had a, had a team of five, and then in 73 with 
backing from the World Wildlife Fund, 28,000, 60,000 from the National Film Board of Canada. Those are the two times I was up there. I've been in Alaska elsewhere. But uh, I have to tell you that whenever I began to think about or look at that bowhead whale, the head is one third of the body. I thought it's got to be a great music maker. It's got to be a great music maker. And uh, actually, in uh, 1985, Chris Clark at the, at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, who's done a lot of work on bowhead whale phonations, he had he recorded 35,000 individual sounds with a big hydrophone array off Point Barrow, 300 miles inside the Arctic Circle. And of those 35,000 sounds, like you'd have A, B, and C. I mean, and then... You have another talent. <laughs> no, no. But, but they were, he had 35,000 vocalizations over that seven-week migration at that time between mid-April and the first week in May. All we do is interrupt one another. These whales are so polite, they're so courteous, they're so intuitive, there turned out to be only 19 overlaps in these phonations, so that A, whale A would make a sound, whale B would make a sound, whale C would make a sound, say 11 to 13 minutes would pass, and then it'd be C, B, A, making different sounds, but never overlapping, and, and different ones seem to initiate it. So it seems like there's a courtesy there yeah. that we might also learn from. And no one taught them that, that's for sure. But that's I have to say that when you first get up there and you put a hydrophone in the water, and at that time the ice was uh, five or six feet thick. Thinner it's, now, right? It's thinner now. Yeah. And, and it, it opens up earlier and stays open later. The sound you hear is actually the song of, of the great bearded seal, a great big guy. And that's a sound of two minutes, and that's got a strong onset. <clears throat> and then... And then it comes up, and the, the Inuit may have been listening with his paddle, and he, he waits him, and, and he may tap him at That's that point. That's awesome. Rich Little's going to call you for some of your impersonations of these whales. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, a true legend, and a guy who really gave us some insight, and started a great movement, Scott McVeigh. Scott? <laughs> It's fantastic that the World Science Festival was able to bring, and as Scott said, you know, these great young researchers who are out there doing it, and here is this pioneer who really started it all, so we thank him for coming. He'll come back a little later. Um, we talked a lot about sounds and the music of these whales, um, and so we thought it was kind of cool and appropriate that we uh, bring you some music. Garth Stevenson, he's a Brooklyn-based composer. Come on out, Garth. Uh, carried his 150-year-old bass, it's a double bass, up to Antarctica to try to gain inspiration for a film score and found himself with an unlikely audience up there. He's here to share the experience with some amazing footage of the actual event. Garth, welcome here. It's yours for a while. Thank you. Um, yeah, three and a half years ago, I got a call from a director to ask if I would score his film that he was shooting in Antarctica. I said, yeah, I would, I would love to do that. And then he called me back a month later and said, do you want to come to Antarctica? In, we're leaving in two weeks. Oh, sure, that'd be great. The phone rings again. He said, hey, will you bring your bass? <laughs> and uh, I've always loved taking my bass out into nature to play, so this was the ultimate opportunity to do that. And with us on the trip was Roger Payne, who we were just speaking about, who uh, recorded with Scott the Songs of the Humpback Whales album. And so before the trip, I bought all the, the whale recordings and started practicing them on the bass, because it actually works pretty well. And uh, one of the scenes in the film uh, was just me giving a concert on the bow at sunset between South Georgia Islands and Antarctica. And I started playing the whale calls, kind of just to show Roger what I'd been up to. And a couple minutes later, 12 psi whales came and started swimming next to our boat. And uh, it was a really magical experience. Uh, chances are they didn't come because of the music. It was probably hard for them to hear, but everyone on the boat really wanted to believe that. <laughs> so, so I'm going to play a piece for you uh, that, that kind of is a quick summary of my trip to Antarctica, uh, being at sea, doing the whale concert, and then waking up to the icebergs um, a few days later. And two weeks ago, Kate sent me some recordings of 
the narwhals and uh, bowheads and belugas. And so I'm, I usually just play the humpback whale calls, but I'm going to try to throw some of those in there too.
that was transformative, I think, right? That was transformative. Uh, what's going on inside you when that happens? I mean, you were so into it. You were, it, was, it was you. It was not the bass, right? You became the bass. The bass became you. You became the whale. We spend a lot of time together, so it really... The, <laughs> the bass, not the whale, right? <laughs> The but but how, did you, how did you compose that? I mean, it's, it was fascinating for so many reasons, uh, not the least of which was seeing someone score uh, a piece of video like that, but right. it, it got inside every one of your fibers, it seemed like. Yeah, well, the, the piece I composed um, just inspired from that trip, but then the whale calls have just kind of been a constant evolution, and um, I'm just trying to do my interpretation of it. Uh, it's, it's very humbling being around these scientists that... Uh, devote their lives to this. I think they're going to tell me it's humbling being around no. you, who can capture what they're trying to capture scientifically. Right. You capture it in some incredibly deep emotional way. I, I thought yeah. anyway. I think the audience did too. It was just, just fantastic. Just fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I've, I've definitely noticed just, just coming from, just to my ears, there's, there's so many connections between the sounds and nature and that come out naturally in music, even just when you play one string and all these different notes come out. Um, when I hear whale songs, I hear a lot. There's a lot of music going on in there. Um, so it's, there's a lot to learn. Garth, that was just spectacular. That was just really moving. Thank you very much. I was uh, transfixed on that. It was just amazing. And then one shot where his, his brow was furrowed and his brow was furrowed here, and it was. Great cinematography. Okay, we want to bring back our, uh, our three young scientists um, who are out there doing this. Um, and we're also going to be joined uh, by a special guest. Uh, so let me bring back Kristen, Kate, and Sarah, if you're there. I'll also bring, <laughs> bring to join our conversation uh, a woman who's been producing pieces about the natural sciences for 20 years. Uh, she is with the American Museum of Natural History. Please welcome Laura Allen. Laura? We're going to talk a little bit about the science and, and putting together what this means for us as humans, uh, putting together all the great things you guys have talked about, and with Laura uh, talking a little bit about the ice and what the different thickness of the ice. You heard Scott say it's a lot thinner now than it was then. You've got some great graphics, and let's start with um, the latest da data from, uh, from NOAA that shows actually very clearly what the changing ice structure and what's happening in the Arctic. Sure, we're going to uh, show you a data visualization that I wrote and uh, produced with a team of scientists and digital artists here at the museum. And it, it really gives some context for how the ice is changing up in the Arctic. Scientists are really impressing upon us now just how dramatic the change is in the Arctic. It's a, it's a fundamentally different Arctic than it was in the 20th century. Um, Right here we have a data set that highlights the seasonal patterns of, of sea ice change over the year. Uh, every March we see a maximum concentration of ice. That it's, it's at its largest extent yearly. And then we have a minimum extent every September. These are natural seasonal changes. However, in 2012, there was something really dramatic that happened. 2012 was actually the absolute lowest uh, extent of ice that has been seen in the satellite record uh, since satellites started taking really reliable measurements in 1979. We can see that this was a record-breaking year last year, 18% uh, smaller than it had been in the previous uh, record-breaking year, which was 2007. So since 1979, this is the smallest ice we've seen, the lowest extent on record. Mm -hmm. And so, actually, the last six years, we've seen the six smallest ice concentration extent uh, on, on the satellite record. So this is a significant trend, and it's one of the indicators that shows how, just how dramatic the changes uh, in sea ice are. And I'd, I'd like to impress that these are real data. This is, these are not animations. These are not illustrations. These are exactly the type of data that scientists are using to make interpretations of how our world is changing, and we use that same data t for educational purposes here at the museum. And this is not political, this is it's, actual it's the satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. It expands 
in March at the end of the winter, and then it obviously shrinks in September. And the and I just want to put it in lay terms so I understand it. Mm -hmm. The maximum in March every year since 1979, that maximum is now shrunk. And the minimum in September has also shrunk. Right. And it's not just a little, it's dramatic. It is dramatic, right. And we're seeing this trend toward smaller minimum extents um, in the September low than, than we have in the past. Uh, and there's uh, all indicators that this is going to continue to these trends will stick. And why is this happening? Warming temperatures, right, clearly, less, less ice up there. Certainly, but what's interesting is that, as we'll see in the, in the next section, that there are some mechanisms that are occurring that are further, they're, they're sort of positive feedbacks on this system. Uh, we see changes in the ice that are making it more break, break up more easily, melt more easily because of uh, Earth processes. So here, for example, this is a, a different data set. This shows ice age. This is how long a parcel of ice has actually been around. One-year-old ice, that's ice that has been tracked since it emerged via satellite. That's been around for one year. Two-year ice is ice that has actually managed to survive that melt season and so on and so on. And so scientists are actually tracking the age of the ice over time. The ice is dramatically not only changing in age, but this is a proxy for how thick the ice is. What you see on the left is Arctic sea ice in 1987. This was after uh, eight years of tracking. We see that there's a lot of very old ice. And old ice is thicker ice, and that is resilient. What we see in this past September is a dramatic reduction in old ice. We see that most of the ice pack is actually made up of, of one or two year ice. So that ice, that young ice, is very thin. It's susceptible to breakage. Uh, it's, it's destabilizing. So that process actually allows more solar energy to uh, affect the, the ocean. It, the ocean is absorbing more solar energy and becoming warmer, and then contributing to that melting. So uh, it's, the ice pack is becoming more fragile, and that's egging on some of the changes we're already seeing. And what happens when, I was in Greenland uh, in 2004, and saw just amazing calving of, of, of glaciers. And it was spectacular, it was spectacular. And some of that is natural, right? Glaciers calve. Uh, cap. And, and yet people were saying that it's happening at a greater frequency. And what happens is that those icebergs that are created get out in the water and desalinate the water, right? The more icebergs that are, that are created, uh, that affects what kind of water is in the ocean. I assume that affects your precious whales, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the input of fresh water into the, the system, I mean, the amount of fresh water you have on the surface compared to the salt water um, is important for ocean processes and circulation and things like that. I, I wouldn't say that's the most important thing to the whales. I mean, they, you know, they, they traverse that freshwater layer in all of their dives, and, and it's you know, not necessarily driving um, everything they're feeding on. So but. what's this thinning mean to your whales, uh, to our whales? Well, I mean, the thinning basically means there is less ice. One thing the thinning is doing potentially is putting more light into the system and thereby uh, increasing the amount of phytoplankton, which are, are plants. And it's these phytoplankton uh, that other plankton, so the copepods I was talking about earlier, or the krill, eat. So temporarily, in fact, uh, there may be more primary productivity and increased numbers of plankton that would be available to whales. So, so in, in fact, it might not all be bad news all the time. Could, for, some of the, there's, for some of those whales, there's more food, right? Potentially. What are the, what are the, what, any other benefits from this? You don't see the benefits, right? The, well, you know, I think there's going to be some um, species that are going to benefit and others that are, are not. And then this is just a, a fact of change, right? Um, and, and aspects like the phytoplankton, which we do bring up in the police briefly, um, this is an active area of research. We're not sure, right, how these changes are going to, how the timing might change of these uh, onset of, of 
phytoplankton blooms, how that might affect uh, up the food chain, but scientists uh, like, like these are working very hard to, to figure these things out. I would say too that I mean a lot. So these whales, that their their entire years are, are sort of planned out. Like the, what they do is very well timed with kind of the formation of the ice and the recession of the ice, and their migrations are timed with when the ice breaks up in spring. That's when the Arctic is most productive, and they move into their feeding areas. And so you know some of the things that we're working on or trying to understand is we see ice breaking up earlier and earlier, and initially you know that's going to create you know more plants in the water column and more production. But, but once you sort of decouple the timing of when the whales need to feed or, or how they've timed their migrations with that peak production period, you could end up with some sort of mismatch in the system that does affect them. And, and these are very difficult questions to answer. I mean, there's so many layers to understand and, and you know, in, in some areas, in most areas, so few data that we, we don't have the answers yet. Right, and so what I hear you saying is that all we know is that things are changing because things are getting warmer. The ice is thinner, uh, the total ice coverage is less, and that is going to have an effect. And we don't, what I understand you're saying, we don't necessarily know what that effect is going to be. No. One of the, one of the negatives uh, is that with less ice cover, you're allowing animals, predators, or new animals, to come into an environment where they weren't necessarily able to get into before. And with uh, our whales, one of their biggest predators are the, is the killer whale. And the killer whale has a huge dorsal fin. And if there's lots of ice, the killer whale can't get into that ice. That's but now, protected. And so our Arctic whales are protected from killer whales. So now with less ice, there's more sightings of killer whales. Um, and potentially, they have the opportunity to prey on the Arctic whales like they wouldn't have had before. Do the, yeah. do the hunters that you talk to, who, so one of you just came back recently, right? Yeah, who, I just came back. Do the hunters understand this intuitively? Do they see? Oh, yeah. I mean, the hunters see these changes, and, and you know, they're not just kind of nice videos that they, you know, can observe. They, they actually, you know, really feel them. I mean, the hunters that I talk to, you know, many of the roots they would take on their dog sledges are totally melted out. Many of the glacier roots, they take, you know, passes over glaciers to get out onto the ice. They can't travel them anymore because they're, you know, they're, they're gone or they've receded so far that it's too dangerous. Um, you know, they can't get out into the sea ice because the sea ice is, is broken up or too thin or they set up a camp and it breaks up early. Um, you know, when they used to hunt from a sledge, now they hunt from a boat. I mean, th these people have seen huge changes and, and you know, the coast is eroding, the houses are falling into the water in some areas. I, I think, yeah, they, these are the people, you know, that are ex really experiencing this firsthand. And how, how, are they, how are they responding to that? Moving inland, right? No, no, I mean, in a lot of places, in so, some places maybe, you know, they'll relocate towns, but in a lot of places it's not, you know, there's either, I mean, it's very costly to move and there are not that many options. So, I mean, it's more of a kind of local adaptation to acknowledging, you know, the loss or acknowledging things that you used to do you can't do anymore and, and you know, trying to find alternatives. So, yeah. What are the dangers, I think, Sarah, besides the killer whales having entrance into places they might not be able to be before? What are the other detriments to these, to these whales that you guys are studying? What are the other detriments? Detriments <laughs> well, to, to whales with ice yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we are. Uh, beluga whales, for instance, uh, um, are migrating into freshwater estuaries. Um, and the, very, the largest one is the St. Lawrence Waterway. So they're actually coming up into rivers that are highly populated by humans and where there's a lot of industrial action going on, a lot of industrial waste are going into these waters. And um, in fact, the beluga whale at one point in its history was the most polluted um, substance on the planet, I think, um, because they were absorbing all this industrial waste. And their skin is very, very sensitive. They probably can absorb an awful lot. So they have cleaned up that problem in the St. Lawrence River to an extent. But these freshwater estuaries um, all through Hudson's Bay are populated by humans. And, and so pollution has affected the whales quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, with the, with the melting Arctic, there, there are physical changes and there are biological changes, but I mean, the human component is a big one, right? So, we, I mean, there are lots of opportunities for humans in the Arctic. There's, there are mineral resources and oil and new shipping routes and tourist options and all of that, you know, th those what we call kind of group as anthropogenic activities are, 
are increasing threats to these species and are linked to the loss of ice because suddenly, you know, we might have a Northwest Passage shipping route, which shortens the shipping route, you know, between across the globe by, by half. And, and um, suddenly there are all of these options for, you know, extracting offshore oil all around the Arctic that, that you know, both the exploration for oil and the drilling for oil is, is pretty disruptive. So, I, I mean, in general, I think that, you know, the, the human interest in the Arctic and moving into the Arctic are all, are all sort of future threats on the horizon, too. And yet these whales have routines. You've described them as sort of not very flexible sometimes, uh, from what I've read about your, some of your works. Um, if they're not flexible, and I don't mean touching their toes, uh, but if they're not flexible in, in their living styles, how, is, how are they re adjusting to this? They have to learn to be flexible a little bit. I assume that upsets the balance of nature as well. Kate? Well, I think with something like the bowhead whale that lives 200 years, uh, they have enough time to be flexible. Shorter lived species like some of the ice seals or potentially belugas or narwhals might have more difficulty adapting to... Uh, it's not just that everything's warming, it's that the variation or what you can expect is getting more extreme. So some years we might have very, very cold years, and other years there might be anomalously warm years, and how do you adapt to this extreme range of variation? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, what is potentially going to cause the problem for these animals, in addition to all the anthropogenic impacts, more uh, predators, and then other species, for instance, humpback whales, fin whales, minke whales, sub-Arctic species that are now moving north, summer whales that are becoming essentially Arctic whales and potentially competing for prey, um, making more noise, making it a little bit noisier. But there's all these things that we, we can hypothesize about, but, but we lack baseline data to even know if we can determine whether or not these changes are actually occurring. Why can't we get that? I mean, you guys, this is your live. Why can't we get that? People out here are going to say, I'm the lay person like these people. Why don't we know that? Why can't we get that? I know it's hard to go do the research, but what do you need? More money? More funding? Uh, we always need more funding. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. I mean, baseline data requires decades and decades. It's, it's a yeah. long-term process. And I would say, I mean, for, for example, the narwhal, I, I, have, I have some visuals that I brought, some photos of the um, whales in the pack ice. I mean, you're studying an animal that lives hundreds of, of miles offshore in dense ice. So this is a, a photo I took. You can see a narwhal in a small lead um, and surrounded by ice. So, that, so they live, you have to get about 100 miles offshore to get to these whales, and then you can observe them in these small leads. And there should be another image after that. Um, and this is an aerial photo. So, so you can see that you have these big white pans of ice. So the, those are the big kind of ice, sheet, ice um, flows. And between them are these leads and cracks, and the very dark colors, uh, the very dark kind of what it yeah. looks like black is actually the open water. Yeah. So, you know, we're trying to understand when you, when you look at this landscape, you think, oh, there's plenty of ice out there. You don't really think there's any sort of problem, but we're trying to understand changes on these enormous spatial scales and link them to these animals that live, you know, in these kind of very small regions. And so it's, it's challenging and, and difficult. And, and we have used, you know, we were looking at those great videos, and, the, and those are, are images of, of, um, from satellites sensing ice in space. And so for narwhals, we've used some of the same type of data. You can see here, it's a, this is an image from space of the ice. And on the right side, you see kind of what you just saw in the photo, the white pans of ice and then the black cracks. And those, that's where the narwhals live. And we can run all kinds of um, algorithms on those images and, and sort of calculate how much open water is out there and available for narwhals and then kind of piece that together over many years and, and look at trends. So that's, that's you know, some of the ways we've been able to try and tease out how the ice is changing and how it's affecting them, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to but do. But Laura's graphics from, from NOAA show that the ice is getting uh, less of a field in, by March, I mean by September, and it's thinner mm -hmm. at all times. Mm -hmm. So that's got to affect the pictures that you saw. Yeah, right, right? yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in what way? Migration? What are the other ways that it could affect it? Yeah. Well, you know, beluga whales feed, well, they feed on lots of stuff. They'll eat just about anything. But in the Alaskan Beaufort, they feed a lot on Arctic cod. And Arctic cod are very ice adapted. They are, they're animals that, as even tiny little cod, will hide in ice fissures and as adults will associate under the ice. 
And it's a, a particularly a very important food source for belugas in the summer where they're in the Canadian Beaufort and the U.S. Beaufort. And as the ice recedes, so does the cod. So the belugas are having to go much further to find cod or they're having to, to change their food sources. You just got back from the Arctic a few days ago? Uh, a week ago. A week ago. Well, that's a few days. Uh, what, what was your latest trip? You were doing some sort of census, is that right? Uh, no, I was going out to try and get some recordings of bowhead whales on the ice and then also help out uh, sampling whales that are harvested by the Inupiat. And what did you find? What, what, what's, what's the takeaway from your a, latest trip? Well, it was a month where we had, for the first time since I think the early 40s, a month of west winds, which pushed the ice into shore. So, so a lead, which normally opens in the spring between the ice that's connected to the shore and the pack ice, never opened. Um, so the, the whalers didn't get to go out and get their whales and every time I would go and drill a hole in the ice to try and record bowheads for the first time in long, long time, we never heard a single bowhead song. I think it's because the animals were migrating far offshore. But, but the other thing that was interesting about this year, despite having the ice inshore for a very long time, is the ice was very, very thin. Uh, near shore it was sometimes less than half a meter. And you know, we have the luxury of having snow machines. We don't have to rely on dog sleds, but every now and then, from out of nowhere, the ice would just open up at the shore. And that's a very, very dangerous place to be because then you can't get back to the beach, especially if you have open water near shore. Exactly. Laura, you, you heard these researchers say they don't, they don't know. How big a race are we in from your vantage point? I think, um, well, you know, there are some predictions uh, that we might have an ice-free summer in the Arctic. This is not that our ice is going to disappear from the Arctic, but uh, some, some predictions say 20, 25 years, perhaps, we'll have ice-free summers. Um, but I, I think that it's, um, like we discussed, it's, it's a matter of establishing these baselines. Um, the Arctic is going to go on. It's just going to be different. And uh, I think, um, I don't know, would you say it's a race? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know or, or if we can necessarily race the change that we see in the climate, but I, I think it's, it's urgent for us to get as much information as we can now so we do have these baselines, and then in 30 years we can look back and say, well, this is what we mm -hmm. knew then, and this is what we see now, and you have these points to compare. If you don't have that, if you don't know anything about now, then it's not really very useful in the future. <laughs> Last quick question for each of you. A year from now, if you were to come back here, what do you hope to find in the next year? What's your goals for the next year for each of your specialties? Start with you, Kate. Well, I'd love to know a little more about bowhead song. I know it's sort of jumping away from, from melting in Arctic, but, but personally, I would really be interested in knowing who sings, why do they sing, and, and when do they sing. We're all looking for that <laughs> answer. <laughs> Kristen? Um, I think I'd like to understand how narwhals are using the pack ice a little bit better, so take some of the data we've collected and, and understand how they're moving around in the ice and how the, you know, the reduction of ice we're seeing affects where they spend the winter. Sarah? Uh, well, I'm uh, going to embark um, starting this summer on making the first comprehensive documentary on narwhal. No one has really attempted to make a really solid natural history movie, and so hopefully with, <laughs> with help, we'll achieve that. And um, we'll be putting cameras uh, on the whales, which will hopefully be able to show us some things that we've never seen before. We've never seen a narwhal feed, ever. No one has, ever. So hopefully we'll be able to get some firsts. Not just have a GPS device locating where they are, but cameras. actually have a camera. That'd yep. be very cool. And maybe. Yep you'll have, be able to show your film at next year's World Science Festival. Yeah. And, and Laura, what, what's your goal for next year besides having your first child? Uh, I'm curious where, what we're going to see next uh, September, uh, if, if this is a continuation of the trends. Obviously, things um, are slightly different every year, so I'm, I'm curious to see if uh, 2013 is another record-breaking year. There you go. Well, thank you all very much. We, we haven't tried to humanize these whales, um, but we have tried to get a little more human understanding of, of what these magnificent animals uh, are doing. And I thank you all for, for uh, uh, being patient, and uh, I hope that you, you learned a lot. We are following the unfolding lives of the bowhead and the beluga and the narwhal uh, through the World Science Festival as, you, uh, as we solve, try to solve some of these mysteries. But as we heard tonight, uh, 
there are more mysteries than there are answers, and, and that's really what science is all about. And um, what great four role models. Um, uh, you heard Scott McVeigh say uh, that he was, you know, you were sort of carrying on his mission, and I think we saw a real uh, multi-generational effort here to, uh, to try to understand these magnificent animals. I really thank you for putting up with my naivete about it, but I, I learned a lot, and I really thank you. And thank you all for uh, participating today. <laughs>